Uh, chapter 11, liquids, solids, and intermolecular forces. So we talked about gases in an earlier chapter. Now we're going to talk about liquids and solids. Um, this is a gecko. And uh, geckos and, and many other lizards can just climb up vertical surfaces, right? It's like Spider-Man or something. You know, how do they do that? If you zoom in and look at their feet and then zoom in some more, at the ends of their, on their, the pads of their feet, they have these little, uh, I didn't read the chapter, I don't remember what they're called, these little things <laughs> with these flat ends. They're almost like microfiber cloths or something. But you've got a lot of surface area here, and the molecules on the ends of these, whatever they're called. <laughs> Okay, I have never, ever claimed to be a biologist. I took biology as a sophomore in high school and never again. I have nothing against biologists, but I'm not a fan, so I don't know what those are called. But it's the little ends here that stick to other surfaces. And what causes them to stick? It's not tape. It's not magnets. What is it? It's intermolecular forces. It's chemistry. And that's what we're going to talk about in this chapter. Intermolecular forces, um, when we look at the, the two parts of this word, inter, that's a prefix that means between. So this is between molecule forces. They exist between all molecules and atoms. They are significant. I'm having issues with my stylus again. Switch to a different one. They are significant only at very short distances. Intermolecular forces are the reason that we have liquids and solids at all. And they are essential for physiological processes. Um, all of the chemical reactions and everything that's going on in your body that's keeping you alive, if there were no intermolecular forces, none of that would work and we wouldn't exist. Whether a particular piece of matter is a gas, a liquid, or a solid depends on the relative strength of the intermolecular forces that it has in, in comparison to the amount of thermal energy. We know that as you heat up an ice cube, it melts to liquid, and you heat the liquid water, and it, it turns into a gas. That's because you're adding thermal energy. The intermolecular force strength remains the same, but it's the relationship between the thermal energy and that intermolecular force that determines the state of the matter. Um, we've talked about states of matter before, but let's just revisit them. Um, water is nice to talk about because we're familiar with its three forms. So in the gas state, we, we call it steam. And if we look at the molecular view, we see that the molecules are far apart. There's a lot of empty space. In liquid water, the molecules are touchingly close. Remember, those intermolecular forces only work at short distances. So here, where the molecules are close together, now the intermolecular forces can have an effect. In solid water, um, the molecules are also touchingly close, but now they're not able to move relative to each other. And the difference between these is due to temperature. Um, 100 degrees or above, we have um, gas. What does increasing the temperature do to the kinetic energy of the particles? It increases the kinetic energy. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the substance. So if it's at a higher temperature, there's more kinetic energy. I think of those intermolecular forces as being a bit like Velcro, right? And if you have two people in Velcro suits and they're running and they bump into each other or they brush against each other, they're probably not going to stick to each other. But if you have people in Velcro suits that are just slowly bumping into each other, they're going to stick, right? There's going to be a resistance. You can overcome the resistance of Velcro with speed, right? You can rip off that buckle on your shoe. 
So we're going to look into that. So the major difference between solids and liquids is freedom of movement. They're, the particles are close together. But in a liquid, they have enough thermal energy to overcome those attractions and allow them to slide around. In the solid state, they're forced to be stationary relative to each other. They can vibrate and wiggle, but they can't move relative to each other. Um, gases are compressible because there's a lot of empty space. And so you can squeeze the particles closer together and make the volume of it smaller. You can't do that with a liquid because there isn't any empty space. You can't push them closer together. So you can press on this all you want, and it's not going to get any smaller. And this is um, the principle that hydraulic systems are based on, that you can press on a liquid on one end of a tube, and it will transfer that force to the other end of whatever conduit that liquid's in. Um, there are different types of solids. Um, there are crystalline solids, and these are characterized by well-ordered three-dimensional arrays. There's a particular order to how the particles are arranged next to each other. There are different kinds of patterns, but there is a pattern. Amorphous, the prefix A means without. Morph refers to shape, so without shape. Amorphous solids, no long range order. They just like jam together. So this is an illustration of a crystalline solid. Here we have a pattern. And an amorphous solid is just all random, just jumbled together. Like my children's socks in their drawer. Actually, if, if we're lucky, they get into the drawer just all massed together, right? Actually, most of the time, they're spread all over the house. Changes in states we're familiar with. We, we watch ice melt. We watch water boil. What's going on between them? Well, as, as we heat up the solid, the increased temperature is increased kinetic energy. And so these particles in the solid that are vibrating are moving faster and faster and faster. And when they get to that melting point, they now have enough energy that they can break loose partially from those attractions that are holding them together. And that allows them to slide around. If we continue heating it, then we increase the energy even more, and some of them are able to escape entirely and get into the gas phase. Cooling down, the opposite happens. As we cool down the gas molecules, they, they're moving slower and slower, and now sometimes when they bump into each other, they stick and they condense into a liquid. As we cool the liquid particles, um, they move slower and slower, and they start to crystallize into a solid. Changes in pressure can also induce transitions between gases and liquids. Um, <clears throat> so if we have a liquid and we reduce the pressure on it, above it, we can um, basically suck out some of the molecules into the gas state. And if we compress a gas, if we increase the pressure, we can cause it to condense. You're probably familiar with LP, liquefied petroleum gas. That's what we use to uh, fire up the gas grill in the backyard. Um, it's liquefied at high pressures. And so that tank is pressurized. And that forces this propane to be in the liquid form. It takes up a lot less space as a liquid. And so that's why they do it this way. When you release the pressure by opening the valve, then, um, then you allow the gas to escape. And you direct that gas into your grill, and you light it, and you cook your hamburgers. 